Um, so, yeah, I just want to really give a warm welcome to Aya Chitananda. It's really delightful to have you here. Um, for me, it's very beautiful also because I don't see my Bikuni sisters very often. So not only is it enriching in terms of teaching, it's also very personally supportive, especially as I'm quite tired today. And uh, even though Aya Chitananda had her COVID vaccine and doesn't feel 100%, she still very kindly agreed to take the lead. So really, really grateful and appreciative of that. I'm putting my earphones in, yes, because the sound is not so great without it. So any better? A better? Yeah? So it should be all right. Uh, but please let us know if the sound is, you know, not great or or anything like that. So the first thing, shall I do it, Aya? Or do you want to do it? Ask about last sure. week's homework. Why don't you go ahead, Venerable, and, and if anybody else wants to say things, then they have the chance. Yeah, let's do that. Let's start that way. So last week, we just started the chapter on generosity. Actually, it's the chapter on personal training, but generosity is the first, um, because one of the classic teachings of the Buddha, usually when he um, taught lay people, he would start with generosity and then um, ethics, virtue. Obviously, uh, generosity is the foundation, really, of ethics. It underpins the whole movement of ethics, which is to give, right? And then bhavana, the development of practice. So we're starting with generosity. And we got through the first two little paragraphs last week on page 31, for those who have the book. Yeah. <laughs> and we did get to the third one, but I just read through it without very much commentary. And last week I suggested that you could look into this practice of giving in your daily life and just see if you can notice the different motivations you might have from time to time. Um, see if you could identify anything here or maybe anything different that's not mentioned here. So I just wanted to give people the opportunity to feed back if you did uh, enjoy experimenting with that or had any insights into the practice of generosity over this last week or even perhaps recollecting previous acts of generosity. So just to give you an opportunity to share before we start. And uh, I think we're going to be pinned, right, Matthias? Okay, so he's trying to pin us so that nobody who speaks will be on the video. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. But if you want to be absolutely 100% sure and you really, really, really don't want to be recorded, you could always pop a message in the chat instead. Please feel free to do that as well. Otherwise, just stick up your virtual hand if you have anything to say or share. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Surely. I have to forget, but I have to confess, I totally forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's getting a habit with me, at least I remember to come here this time. Um, but I did notice that, um, and it is one of, it's a result of giving that I get a lot of joy. And I'm not sure about this word elation, I'm not quite sure what the Pali word for that is, maybe, maybe you or I could explain that. But joy, joy and delight, certainly, arise um as i'm giving and that's that's really the purpose of giving i don't and and it's quite nice that the buddha says that that's okay and yeah <laughs> it does bring me joy so i just thought i'd share that thank you shirley do you want to add anything venerable or shall i yeah, I, I don't know, Shirley. Uh, hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, but yeah, Shirley, I, I don't have the poly in front of me. So I'm not sure about the word elation, but I have a feeling it's probably PT and Sukha. And PT has so much um, similarity 
to like the feeling of meta and the same feeling for me arises when I have an opportunity to share something. So probably PT. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's all I wanted to interject. Do you have anything, Venerable? Um, I guess I was just looking at the English meaning of the word and I thought elation in a way sounds kind of maybe quite extreme, but if you think about elevation, like something that elevates your mind, something light, something that brings a sense of buoyancy, that also could be part of that meaning. But that would also be true in the case of PT, because PT uh -huh. kind of elevates, lifts up the energy. So, yeah. yeah. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Should we, should we go with the next? person i forget how um they get unmuted is it gunta's taking care of that so he'll okay, unmute them you. and call out their name so you don't have to okay. do anything and can we just check uh, i think shirley might have a follow-up on on the previous one is that okay yeah of course uh no i haven't really got anything more to say just that oh i'm not did i not put my hand down sorry um I just thought that it might be peaty but again I thought elation was a bit excitable mm. <laughs> we go to Maxwell hi uh am I coming through okay yeah that's right yes thank you um just as a, a grandparent, um, my wife and I had to look after our seven-year-old grandson who still believes in getting up at 5.30 in the morning and not going to bed till 10 o'clock at night. So I think we did a lot of giving. We, we are guardians um, because unfortunately his, his father died and so we see him quite regularly and, and he's in our bubble. Uh, but um, yes, I think we, we had a lot of giving to do for, for five days. Anyway, that, that's, that, that was our giving. <laughs> that... Yeah, quite a gift, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, Very lucky just... to have you. <laughs> yeah. So we, we, we're resurrected for this evening <laughs> as he's gone home. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> now it's your turn to be generous to yourself and, and take nice time off and rest. So <laughs> good. Yeah. Are we Have ready? Connie? Yeah. Hi. Um, after having read the paragraph, it was more a question. I didn't really understand some of the reasons for giving. So there was one that said a gift from hatred and a gift from delusion, a gift from fear. I didn't really understand what was meant by that. Does it mean yeah. taking you from yeah. from a place of hatred? I just it didn't didn't make mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, I think I think it takes a little bit of digging into um, what I would say is giving from some kind of ulterior motive. Like if if you want to give this gift to impress somebody so that you'll get a better job, or you know you're you're giving somebody something you know is not good for them because you're angry with them. Um, I knew I knew someone who. Uh, had an abusive husband and she in, in sort of a way of like subconsciously getting back at him she was feeding him all of this really unhealthy food that she knew he liked because she knew it wasn't good for him and so that's something that's totally an unwholesome kind of giving <laughs> cooking all of this nice food that he liked and it's bad for him so things like that you just kind of reflect and see what are my real intentions here? What is behind this desire to give that may not be so wholesome? Yeah. 
<laughs> and and fear makes that list often like in the sutras you'll see doing things out of greed hatred and delusion and they tack on fear because it's also very unwholesome and when we look at when fear drives us to do something the results are often not not well intended and good it's just like a survival kind of instinct or something that may not in the end give you any good karma <laughs> you might be doing yourself a disservice long run so yeah did you want to add anything venerable or all good yeah okay okay <laughs> let me go on <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Hi, Venerable. Nice to see you. Um, I've been working with generosity this week, and um, I've, I've noticed I've got a couple of short reflections. One, one is um, I actually came from looking at the qualities of miserliness, and I recognised I was getting really frustrated with somebody eating my blueberries. Okay, and I know this sounds silly when I say it out loud, but I was getting quite worked up about the fact that my breakfast was being, you know, <laughs> disappearing um, when everyone was supposed to be responsible for their own shopping. And, um, and I found myself being quite miserly and mean in attitude. And I noticed that I started to shrink in inwards a bit and I started to close down and I became, uh, it started to feed um, more unwholesome thoughts, this whole approach. So... I replaced that a couple of days later by buying some more blueberries and making an open invitation for people to help themselves um, and try not to be too irritated if they disappear. Um, and actually, I found that really helpful because I've opened up again um, and I found myself being, being more giving and more loving. So that's one of my examples. And the second is, it's interesting what you were saying about one gives a gift from hatred because to me, I was I was feeling some animosity, and instead of acting out of animosity, in another example, I actually chose to do something generous, and that changed my thought process towards that person. So I actually read it in that way, and and um, and, and and acted like that, and I thought that was helpful too. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Oh, beautiful! Thank you for sharing. <laughs> That's great. Um, I'll unmute Diana. Thanks. Um, sometimes when I give a gift, I have a hope that the person will like the gift. And that, that comes along with a little bit of fear that they won't like the gift. And if they don't like the gift, then it hurts my feelings or I feel sad and I wonder if that is giving out of fear perhaps hmm. I don't think I would characterize it that way quite um, and I, I think that sounds completely normal if you're giving a gift you you want to give something useful and something that they'll like so that's wholesome <laughs> and if they don't like it um your, your karma hasn't really changed. Your generosity was still there and you just learn from it. Oh, they didn't, they didn't like this. I'm not going to give them that again or something similar. Um, but I, I wouldn't worry too much. I don't think it is truly coming out of fear. It's coming out of mm, a desire to do something nice for someone that they're going to appreciate and like. So, you know, just noticing how it feels for you and, holding it a little bit lighter maybe and and not um beating yourself up over it i would say yeah please always feel free to interject anything venerable chanda <laughs> oh no i think that's a beautiful um response and i would agree with that actually that the main motivation is um one of generosity wanting to give to bring happiness you know to the other person and it's natural that we want to feel happy ourselves. but I think like you said if even if they don't like the gift if we can connect with our motivation for giving that gift and we can rejoice in that regardless of the outcome because we can never control outcomes in life 
then you can still find some happiness. It just might take a little bit more reflection. And if you do feel really disappointed and sad, then I think, again, it's about developing your, the right attitudes at that point towards the sadness that you feel, not pushing it away, not judging it, but just holding yourself with a bit of compassion and understanding that's very natural. So, yeah, I, I would agree totally. I also see that there's a question in the chat box. Should we, um, shall I read it out? And, and maybe Venerable Chittananda can, can give some reflection on that one. Yeah? Sure. Thank you. Hey, so I'm having a question about altruistic giving. When I read the eight reasons for giving, it seems that none of them fits into this category. Am I right in my understanding? Yeah, I kind of noticed that too. I was like, they, they all bring benefit to yourself as well. Um, I, I remember reading something in the introduction talking about the intersection, but I can't quite recall. Can you, Ayachanda? There was a part in there. In the introduction? Yeah, in the introduction to the chapter, he was talking about sort of the altruistic aspect. Oh, um, let me find it. Yeah. I mean, in any, any giving, it's going to benefit the other person as well. So whether or not it's your intention for it, they're still going to benefit if it's, you know, the right, the right kind of gift. So hopefully it doesn't, um, it's not all one-sided just for you. <laughs> and looking at it yeah. that way wouldn't be, wouldn't be so nice either. But do you find yeah. it acceptable? No, I don't find the word altruistic, but I, I think, um, I guess my understanding of this passage is to help us to look at our motivations. It's not really so mm -hmm. much to talk about types of giving as reasons of giving. So I would say we're looking more at where we're coming from and mm -hmm. your mind won't be placid, elevated or having piti sukha um, and you won't be beautifying the, the mind if it's not altruistic giving. So I would say yeah. that altruistic giving is included in, in certainly in the last two. Yeah. There has to be an, al an element of altruism in that for your mind to become really free and really light because it's letting go of that sense of self. It's thinking of others. And it's that that brings the joy, right? Because giving is a way of dissolving that sense of self and that sense of separation between self and others. Yeah. So yeah, I think... Um, it's more looking at where you're coming from, but also the result of that giving, like what's happening mm -hmm. in your mind. And then you can kind of maybe infer that if your mind is happy and elated, there was an element of selflessness there. Yeah, I did find it um, in the oh. book. Maybe I'll just read that little paragraph or maybe just part of it. I think it's all helpful and it's not that mm. one. Maybe I'll go for it. Okay, so virtuous behavior itself is cultivated by undertaking precepts and acting in accordance with the 10 courses of wholesome action. The five precepts, pancha sila, constitute the most fundamental moral code taught by the Buddha, abstaining from killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, false speech, and the use of intoxicants. Following these precepts, according to text 222, is called accomplishment in virtuous behavior, a broader moral code, which includes as well inward attitudes and right view, is laid out in the 10 courses of wholesome action, which expand the requirements of right speech and also include mental orientations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the precepts and courses of wholesome action regulate bodily and verbal conduct, ensuring that we do not inflict harm on others. They also mold our intentions so that we recognize what kind of attitudes lead to conflict and disharmony and replace them with benign intentions that promote concord. Text 223 shows that the benefits of observing the precepts do not accrue solely to oneself but extend to countless others, giving an immeasurable number of beings freedom from fear, enmity, and affliction. Thus, virtuous behavior unifies self-benefit and the benefiting of others. Yeah, it merges the imperative of enlightened self-interest with that of ethical altruism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that goes very well with what you're saying, Venerable. <laughs> That's yeah. really lovely, isn't it? The merging yeah. of enlightened self-interest and ethical altruism, because really the two have to be 
inseparable. I mean, if you're getting enlightened, but it's not benefiting others, what's the point of enlightenment? And if you're benefiting others, but it's just making you miserable, also something's wrong there, either in your motivation or in the balance between the two. So yeah. that's really Bikkhu Bodhi has a way with words. It's, it's very beautiful. Uh, yeah. Great. Well <laughs> done for finding it. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think? Shall we start with the reading? Would you like to? Yeah. Happy just to go, go for away. it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're all we're all good with that third one. So starting with the fourth on page 32, a superior person's gift. I kind of don't like that translation <laughs> of a superior person. It sounds a little, ooh, it doesn't sit right with me. Um, so Bhante Sujato calls it a person of integrity, which I like much better. <laughs> but, you know, opinions, right? Um, so it says there are, uh, shall we switch it to mendicants like Dante Sujato does? Is that good? Gender neutral instead of monks? Okay, there are mendicants, these five gifts of a superior person or a person of integrity. What five? He gives a gift out of faith. He gives a gift respectfully. He gives a gift at the right time. Oh, they give they give a gift with a generous heart. They give a gift without denigration. Yeah, I'm glad they explained this more. <laughs> because they give uh, a gift out of faith, wherever the result of that gift ripens, they become rich, affluent, and wealthy. And they are handsome, comely, graceful, endowed with supreme beauty of complexion. Because they give a gift respectfully, Wherever the result of that gift ripens, they become rich, affluent, and wealthy, and their children and spouses and servants, <laughs> messengers and workers are obedient, lend their ears to them and apply their minds to understand them. Because, he, because they give a gift at the right time, wherever the result of that gift ripens, they become rich, affluent, and wealthy, and, and benefits come to them at the right time in abundant measure. Because they give a gift with a generous heart, wherever the result of that gift ripens, they become rich, affluent, and wealthy, and their mind inclines to the enjoyment of excellent things among the five cords of sensual pleasure. Because they give a gift without denigrating themselves, and others, wherever the result of that, that gift ripens, they become rich, affluent, and wealthy, and no loss of their wealth takes place from any quarter, whether from fire, floods, the king, bandits, or unloved heirs. These mendicants are the five gifts of a person of integrity. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I don't have too much to say about this, although one could say a bunch about this. I'm not that... Um, gifted <laughs> so one thing i found interesting is like in in all of them they all talk about gaining wealth for the person giving in the future um no matter you know which of these they're talking about um and the the results are all very worldly worldly results the other ones that they speak about so um it's encouraging for people who are not set on enlightenment but i think we get we get further down if we <laughs> if we don't necessarily hold these as our intention like oh what am i going to get out of this yeah anybody have questions or thoughts or maybe venerable chanda has something to say not really <laughs> okay i'm happy to listen <laughs> oh <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm I'm sure you're much better at explaining things, but I'll see if anyone's got questions. Oh, it looks like maybe Diana has a comment or question. Um, I'm really surprised about number four, that the mm -hmm. reward is the enjoyment of excellent things among the five chords of sensual pleasure. Because that's yeah sounds like it's encouraging craving and you know yeah in a way normally we want to guard ourselves 
against, not against, mm -hmm. but. Yeah, I think these are, are just, mm, again, if, you, if you're using this as motivation for your generosity, it's not good because yes, it would, it would sort of increase your sensual desire. I think this is more really in the end talking about the natural outcome of these different ways of giving. So like it, it's sort of like that simile about the chickens sort of um, taking good care of their eggs, you know, like sitting on them, making sure they're looking after them. And then they don't have to wish that the chickens will hatch um, and be healthy and their little babies will be fine. It's just a natural outcome. So I think this, this is kind of like that. It's, it's talking about the natural outcome when you give in the, these ways. And number four, with a generous heart, the natural outcome will be like, you will have the benefits of enjoying excellent things among the five chords of sensual pleasure. And I agree with you. It doesn't mean you should um, go overboard with them or seek them out. Or, you know, the craving and the clinging should definitely be let go of, like examined and let go of. But if you think about just being able to have these things in your life, um, it, it's a benefit. I mean, you think about people in poor countries where they don't even have enough normal staple food. And the results of your generosity are going to bring them to have, bring you to have more than enough, say, or better food, say, or something, you know. So, yeah, I agree that the grasping shouldn't be there for these things, but it's a natural outcome of mm -hmm. the generosity. Mm -hmm. Roundabout way of saying it, but yes. <laughs> no, that's a wonderful way of explaining it, actually. I found that very helpful, um, especially <laughs> that difference between enjoying and just receiving the natural outcome, as you put it. And actually pursuing it or like craving and clinging to it there's a difference the buddha didn't say we can't enjoy the benefits of our good karma he didn't say we have to live you know in kind of dungeons and sleep on hard floors he actually didn't he actually warned against you know aestheticism to the extreme um he wanted us to be comfortable enough and i think also if a person really has that generous heart and is giving from that place if they do then become rich wealthy and affluent and, and have everything they need then that's going to benefit others because they're a generous person they're going to share it right yeah. so in that sense it's um it, it's like that simile in the sort of somewhere about brightness to brightness like there's four kinds of people one is like going from darkness to brightness so they don't have yeah. much material um happiness they don't have very much at all maybe they've really struggled in life maybe they've had traumatic experiences or even grown up without parents you know they're, they're born into a condition of darkness but then they continue to develop generosity and beautiful qualities and they change their fortune slowly you know at least they start changing their attitude right first of all and that changes their fortune but then you have the person um yeah the opposite going from darkness to darkness you're just like oh these people did this to me this is why i'm in such a terrible condition blah 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 and then you have the person like who's going from brightness but perhaps in this case this is a person with brightness but then if they do start to grasp and cling at all those benefits that will actually change the good karma into more negative karma and so gradually they'll lose those benefits or you can have the person who goes from brightness to brightness which hopefully is this person you know, so you have this generosity, you have a lot of affluence and wealth and, um, you know, you can enjoy your life in a comfortable way, but then you don't stop there. You realize, okay, well, this is because of my generosity. This isn't owed to me by anyone. Um, I should keep on cultivating that quality and make sure I do the best with it, you know, because I often think it must be a real burden to be, say, like a multimillionaire and then not to really do anything with that. You know, like, I mean, what a burden, because really you've got the power to help so many people, but you've got to make a choice to use it wisely. Otherwise, I don't see that that is really actually very ethical. I would go so far as to say that I don't think it's ethical to have like multi, say, these billionaires, you know, hoarding like as much as the country of Bangladesh. <laughs> 
but if you do a lot of good with that then that's that's different and i would just like to say something hopefully out of generosity um that it's really great to have your insights Aya, and um please don't underestimate your contribution be generous to yourself <laughs> yeah thank you i'm happy to share i'm not uh i'm not like a, a teacher i don't frequently give dhamma talks or anything so i don't have your experience and when i when i do i'm always just happy to share the dhamma but don't look to me for <laughs> like, you know, I, I much defer to you. <laughs> well, it's interesting. We all have our perceptions and perspectives, yeah. Because I, I um, very rarely refer to myself as a teacher. For a long time, I'm just like, I share the Dhamma. And then after a while, everyone else starts to refer to you that way. So I think there's no um, objective truth there, really. Maybe it's... Maxwell's turn to talk. Hi. I, I just wondered if it could possibly be interpreted when you say uh, they become rich, affluent and wealthy in spirit. So I wondered if the interpretation could be not particularly in a worldly sense, but more in a spiritual sense. It's just a, a thought I have, that's all. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think the effect on your mind is going to have that spiritual effect. So I'd agree, yeah. Could be both. <laughs> I think someone else, was there another hand and maybe they changed their mind? Okay. Maybe we keep going, huh? Okay, I'll just keep going. <laughs> okay, so the next one is, um, do, do you read the references before you read the passage or does that help? I don't know. I don't know, yeah. I'm just spontaneous really. I don't okay. have a particular way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> so number five, the gift of food. Monks, or mendicants, if people knew, as I know, the results of giving and sharing, they would not eat without having given, nor would they eat, oh, nor would they allow the stain of miserliness to obsess them and take root in their minds. Even if it were their last morsel, their last mouthful, they would not eat without having shared it, if there were someone to share it with. But mendicants, as people do not know, as I know, the results of giving and sharing, they eat without having given, and the stain of miserliness obsesses them and takes root in their minds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know monastics who like to practice with this and they leave a little bit out for animals or whoever might be around or if they're with someone, they'll take something out of their bowl and share it just for that nice heart opening quality. <laughs> um, sometimes people are out around Santa Cruz, which is a town around us, and there's a lot of homeless people um, sort of living on the coast, living at the beach or in little encampments nearby, and people will have signs out that say just hungry or something, and it's always nice to share a little bit of food, so if I have some, I like to <laughs> if I have some with us, so yeah, anybody have comments or questions? That was pretty straightforward, maybe. <laughs> Never wrong to share. Yeah, can I say something? Please. <laughs> I'm just thinking, like, it's a curious passage in a way, because you're thinking, what does the Buddha know about this that we don't know? You know, like, <laughs> is it such a huge benefit? And I was thinking it, it's probably because it's not so much, a little bit like Maxwell was saying, it's not so much about um, the actual outcome, even of giving food to another person or um, although that is very beautiful but I think it's also because you are conditioning your mind in ways that's going to kind of infiltrate and imbue everything you do in your life it's going to infiltrate your attitude in meditation right it's going to help establish that right attitude that we can practice not for 
ourselves, but for all beings. It's a kind of way of inclining our mind against the stream of craving. And I think this is what he's pointing at here. It could be what he's pointing at. You know, it's not just about being generous, like in the physical world, but it's about your entire kind of leaning in life that actually starts to send you against the stream, so to speak, against the stream of craving in a different direction to the rest of the world. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else want to say anything? Or should we keep going? Maybe we keep going, huh? Yeah, we're getting through some today. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, quality versus quantity, huh? <laughs> Stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> no, quality is good. We don't have to get through a whole bunch. Ah, uh, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, they got a hand. John. Okay, hi there. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, I have a lovely story about sharing um sharing food actually. Um I was lucky enough to attend a a Katina ceremony at our local Buddhist monastery here in, in down in um, in Surrey. And it was brilliant because there was so much sharing and giving and generosity being shown that day by the community of lay people. And and uh, there was this the gifts were being being given to the monastery. But that was just one thing, but and there was a lovely spread of food for to be shared amongst all all people that had congregated there with the monks as well and I noticed as I was given somebody because I, I participated and helped out during that day but I noticed um, I was uh, somebody had put some food aside for myself because I was helping out with the monks but then I saw this young lady girl she was eating an apple it was um, and there was a wasp a, fly, a wasp coming to eat the apple and and I was observing this this young girl and she got to a stage where she couldn't eat any more of the apple without the wasp getting too close to her and it was really beautiful this was just a lay person and she put the apple down on the floor so that the wasp could finish eating the apple and it was so symbolic for me it's just like wow that's so good Mo normally in our country we sort of push these flies away you know and we don't share anything at all or in fact we try to kill them but uh, it was mm -hmm. in a, I, I had a moment it just enlightened me there and then to like understand that actually we're all here you know and we can share <laughs> and it was all going on there there and this was a lovely story so i thought i'd share it there you are. okay yeah thank you that's great <laughs> yeah i think something we covered last time it was talking about renunciation and the relationship with donna and i think restraint too is a a big one that you could consider generosity not taking too much or you know, stop eating the apple and share it or <laughs> whatever. So nice. Thank you. Okay. I think we're good to keep going. Yeah. Okay. So the gift of food, again, <laughs> more food. <laughs> Number two, a woman, noble disciple. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in this case, the story is about a woman, but any noble disciple by giving food gives four things to the recipient. What for? They give long life, beauty, happiness, and strength. By giving long life, they themselves will be endowed with long life, human or divine. By giving beauty, they themselves will be endowed with beauty, human or divine. By giving happiness, they themselves will be endowed with happiness, human or divine. By giving strength, they themselves will be endowed with strength, human or divine. A noble disciple, by giving food, gives those four things to the recipient. Mm. Yep. Doesn't matter. You, you can never tell when the karma is going to ripen in this life or the next. So it's kind of nice to bring that in, <laughs> human or divine. Yeah. Mm. I don't really have... Uh, any more thoughts on this one other than it sounds good? <laughs> it 
nice to share for, yeah, the results will come back. That chicken and the baby eggs again, the baby chicks hatching naturally comes this way, whether you're grasping after it or not. Don't grasp. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Any more? Oh, Elvira has something to say. <laughs> Um, I have a question. Uh, I don't have a copy in front of me, but uh, I think I heard by giving beauty, one would uh, receive it back. And we're still speaking about food offerings, I guess. And could you elaborate a bit more? What could it be giving beauty? Maybe if it's just talking about, since it is talking about food, um just making something look nice, some dish look nice, if it, if it really is, I don't know, I haven't quite, uh, giving food. oh, yeah, uh, so it's just kind of going in order, long life, beauty, happiness, and strength, so the food provides those things for the recipient. So maybe it's not just about the food being pretty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the results of the person eating the food, obtaining, um, you know, the long life, the beauty, the happiness, and the strength. So I think it's just going through the list in sort of a, mm, you know, as the Buddha does, just enumerating the qualities that come out of it. So, yeah. I don't think it's necessarily about giving beautiful food. <laughs> she's, she's giving the person um, food that will be healthy for them. And, you know, in that way, giving them beauty. So in her next life, she will have that. Or in this life, too, maybe. I don't know. Mm. Not sure when it'll ripen again. <laughs> Did you have thoughts, Venerable Chanda? Um, the only thought... I'm having is it's interesting like you say the Buddha's enumerating this list and I think he's trying to make a connection between the type of giving and the result like basically you get the same as you give more or less and of course it can be more nuanced than that but if you give happiness you generally um, the other person receives happiness right or, or by giving happiness you yourself feel happy because we just pick up on those things between ourselves it's like it, it becomes contagious, doesn't it? If somebody's happy, you know, and, and they give you the gift of happiness just by virtue of being around that person. And it's maybe the same with beauty too, even if unrelated to the food. It's like if two people are kind of glowing in each other's company, then the whole thing, you, you, you know, you're seeing the beauty in each other and that seems to get increased. Yeah, yeah. And food is just so, so fundamental to our existence, right? So mm. like we all kind of need this food and it does really, it can of course bring long life, beauty, happiness, and strength. I mean, again, looking at poor people who don't have enough food and how downtrodden and mm. just unable to function, <laughs> they don't have any of those four things. So that's right. Yeah. Just the, there's the mundane level and then the level you were talking about, Ayachanda. <laughs> mm. yeah, the more spiritual a mental world level mm -hmm. yeah yeah it actually makes me question the meaning of the word beauty even at the physical level because maybe here we're sort of so vain somehow in the west right like you have to look a certain way and have a certain sort of style of face <laughs> with your eyes in this place your nose in that place but perhaps here it's just simply talking about the fact that being healthy is beautiful right it's beautiful mm -hmm. not to be starving you've got a, a, a body that's working this is already beautiful Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not necessarily yeah. looking for perfection yep <laughs> okay I don't see any more hands up so maybe we keep going huh okay, yeah. okay. okay. the gift of the Dhamma oh this is good <laughs> okay so mendicants there are these two kinds of gifts what two the gift of material goodness and the gift of the Dhamma of these two kinds of gifts the gift of the Dhamma is foremost. There are these two kinds of offerings, these two kinds of generosity, these two, ki uh, two objects of relinquishment. What two? The relinquishment of material goods and relinquishment by giving the Dhamma. 
these are the two kinds of relinquishment. Of these two kinds of relinquishment, relinquishment by giving the Dhamma is foremost. Yeah. Mm hmm. <laughs> yep. I think a lot of the time when you're talking about giving the Dhamma as a lay person, um, when you have spiritual friends or even just friends who are not connected to your Dhamma life necessarily, and if they're having trouble and you're sharing the Dhamma with them, maybe in ways that are not directly using the words if they're not open to that but if they are to just sharing the dhamma in that way can can really be a important and useful gift for them it can change their life sometimes in some cases so it is an act of giving your time and your energy and your effort to think about it and spend it with them and share mm -hmm. yeah because i know like the buddha himself said anytime there's people around and wanting to talk to him he's always kind of looking for the out <laughs> he's always looking for a way to get away and and be by himself and go practice alone and so spending the time with them sharing the dhamma and, and putting his effort into helping them understand and even using his psychic powers to see where they're at and what they need and you know it does take a lot of energy and effort and and it is a gift it is an act of dana so yeah, I think that's how I see this one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts, comments, questions? Venerable Chanda wisdom to share. <laughs> it just reminds <laughs> me of uh, <laughs> it just reminds me of another sutta which we read, I think, uh -huh. a couple of weeks ago, where the Buddha's saying about ethics and about not only practicing ethics but also speaking in praise of virtue, and then also. Uh, encouraging others I think yeah it's practicing it or like abstaining from wrong action body speech or mind and then speaking in praise of that and then encouraging others to do that as well so that can also be a way of sharing the Dhamma at a very basic level I mean it's actually not that basic because when we live a virtuous life there is a certain amount of beauty and trust and a feeling of safety that we offer to others you know they know that they can rely on us to be honest we might not be perfect, but at least we, you know, we, we're honest enough and we're, you know, trying to be non-violent enough that people can relax around us. And um, yeah, I don't think it necessarily means you have to be teaching the Dhamma. It's just like your life can be a gift in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anybody have questions or comments? Anyone else? Okay. Maybe I can say one more thing because it came oh. up in a conversation today with a friend. And um, apparently last week I said something about mindfulness and the way that mindfulness sometimes becomes commercialized. And um, mm. in that sense, I was thinking about, you know, for example, when it's being taught, but sometimes it might be done with a motivation of making money from it as a business. And I think that was what I was meaning to refer to last week, but I just want to say here for clarity that that is not the motivation of the majority of mindfulness teachers. So I didn't mean anything personal towards mindfulness teachers in general, because even this is a way of sharing the Dhamma. You know, you're sharing an aspect of the Dhamma. It might not be the whole Eightfold Path, but it can also be an opportunity to like bring um, some tools and some ways of working with our mind and overcoming, you know, um depression or improving our health and that too is um a way of serving that especially to people who might not otherwise come in contact with the teachings right so it's being done in a secular way but i just wanted to say that in case there was any doubt in anybody's mind that you know i know that most people who are involved in sharing the dhamma as monastics as lay teachers or as mindfulness teachers generally are coming from a very good place and that's another way of being generous you know so not not all mindfulness teachers are just in it for the buck <laughs> you just hear about some cases sometimes you know where they're charging like three thousand pounds for a weekend retreat or something and then i just think ah oh, that's a bit you know worrying but we never really know where people are coming from so i think we have to you know we have to be honest to ourselves like what is really our motivation and just keep trying to purify that 
Yeah. Yeah. And the people who are lucky enough to um, feel the need for more than just mindfulness will benefit too. We'll get further down the path. So it's a good entry, huh? Exactly. Yeah. It can be a really good entry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Maxwell's got his hand up. <laughs> I, I hope I'm not saying saying too much, but um, I once went on a, a, a mindful compassion course, which was very reasonable, I must admit. Um, and one of the exercises we had to do, I was sat next to someone whom I didn't know at all. Um, and we had to look into one another's eyes for two minutes and the person next to me if I could be rude almost wasn't very good looking at all by the time we'd finished looking or might me looking into her eyes she became absolutely beautiful within and we both ended up tearful and just to say the on the paragraph before you know long life and beauty sometimes you see beauty in extraordinary places and it doesn't have to be beauty of the of the face of the person well it's deep in the person <laughs> so yeah that was, that's great yep and uh, that's that's the kind of beauty that's actually worth something. Not so much the physical, the internal. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think we can keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the gift of the Dhamma. Mendicants. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Just did that one. <laughs> okay. So uh, we've gotten to virtuous behavior past the dana and into the sila. Okay, so one, moral introspection. What do you think, Rahula? What is the purpose of a mirror? For the purpose of reflection, Bhante. So too, Rahula, an action with the body should be done after repeated reflection. An action by body, oh, sorry, by speech should be done after repeated reflection. An action by mind should be done after repeated reflection. Rahula, when you wish to do an action with the body, you should reflect upon the same bodily action thus. Would this action that I wish to do with the body lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both? Is it an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences, with painful results? When you reflect, if you know, this action that I wish to do with the body would lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both. It is an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences, with painful results. Then you definitely should not do such an action with the body. But when you reflect, if you know, this action that I wish to do with the body would not lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both. It is a wholesome bodily action with pleasant consequences, with pleasant results. Then you may do such an action with the body. Also, Rahula, while you are doing an action with the body, you should reflect upon that same bodily action thus. Does this action that I am doing with the body lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both? It is an unwholesome bodily action. Is it an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences, with painful results? When you reflect, if you know, this action that I am doing with the body leads to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both. It is an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences, with painful results. Then you should suspend such a bodily action. But when you reflect, if you know, this action that I am doing with the body does not lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both. It is a wholesome bodily action with pleasant consequences, with pleasant results then you may continue in such a bodily action. Also, Rahula, if you have done an action with the body, you should reflect upon that same bodily action thus. Did this action that I did with the body lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both? Was it unwholesome bodily action 
with painful consequences, with painful results. When you reflect, if you know, this action that I did with the body led to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both, it was an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences, with painful results. Then you should confess such a bodily action, reveal it, and lay it open to the teacher or to your wise companions in the holy life. Having confessed it, revealed it, and laid it open, you should undertake restraint for the future. But when you reflect, if you know, this action that I did with the body did not lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both. It was a wholesome bodily action with pleasant consequences, pleasant results. You can abide happy and glad, training day and night in a wholesome state. Yeah, I like this one. <laughs> yeah, I, I love how in Buddhism there's no the Buddha doesn't really condemn people. He's like, there's always a chance for your own redemption. You correct it yourself. You confess, you talk about it, you reflect, and you sort of forgive yourself and correct what you can and move on. So, yeah, it's it's nice that you have the opportunity beforehand. You examine, oh, is this going to hurt anybody or myself? And during, you can stop midstream while you're doing something. <laughs> if you realize it <laughs> a little too late, but still going, you can stop. Uh, and at the end, you reflect. So, yeah, I like this one. <laughs> Anybody have questions or comments? Yeah, I. Um, it's very beautiful, you know, because the, the outcome at the end, like you say, it doesn't have punishment. It doesn't have like, oh, you're terrible. Then you're a hopeless case, even if you didn't reflect before, during or after. <laughs> well, <laughs> if you reflect afterwards, it's good enough, right? You reflect afterwards and okay, we've made a mistake. We've done something that was harmful to ourselves, usually to both, right? If we harm ourselves, we harm another. If we harm another, we had to have, often we've harmed ourselves in the process. And just as monastics, it's so lovely that we have this opportunity to confess. And I think sometimes the word confession might sound a bit Christian. I mean, to me, it sounds a bit like, <gasps> you know, but actually it doesn't work that way in the Sangha. Like we have our spiritual friends and we go to them to tell them just to kind of, as a way of being honest, as a way of being honest with ourselves and honest with others and also being open to invite feedback, to invite correction, not punishment, but just advice or um, guidance and I think that's a really important mindset for the practice that we are open to being guided you know and, and in that sense like I said earlier we're all teaching each other right it's not like this one's a teacher this one's not a teacher we're all anyone we can learn from any situation we can learn from is not really a mistake anymore because even if you do something terrible you can learn right and you know <laughs> through direct experience not to do that again so yeah just like just to echo what you said really that the buddha's teaching is just incredibly compassionate you know, incredibly forgiving yeah yeah i think shirley's got her hand up it's not a question it's just a, a, a another comment on the, the buddha's wonderful compassion and teaching is that it's the the, the Good action is judged about being beneficial, not just for others, as we were sort of maybe taught in Christianity, but for ourselves as well. So that it's got to be, it's got to be beneficial, should be beneficial for ourselves and others, and that's how we judge our behaviour. And I just think that's so lovely. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. That's all. Yeah. Um, something, something in the introduction to this chapter again was talking about um, not doing anything out of generosity or good for others that would harm your own sort of moral integrity and it made me think of that sutta where there's I think it's like 97 in the Majjhima I read it not too long ago so it's <laughs> kind of in my mind um, there's a some kind of king's official and he's sort of taking money from the Brahmins Kind of cheating them out of some like tax money or something so it's sort of skimming off the top from the brahmins and he's also taking some from the king and his excuse i think he's talking to venerable sariputta and his excuse is like oh i have 
all of this family I have to take care of. And I have, you know, parents and workers and all these people I need to be looking after that need this money. And I need all this money to be a good, you know, employer or son or parent or whatever. And, and of course, this is not good. <laughs> Stealing is not good. Even if you think you have a good reason for doing it, like it's, it's benefiting someone else. So when we're, when we're doing something, the means do not justify the ends. We have to be really careful not to risk hurting our, our own integrity, our own morality, because the consequences will be bad, no matter how, how good our intentions are for helping others. Yeah, I don't know, just thinking about it, so I thought I'd bring it up. But yeah, anybody else have questions or thoughts or things they like to share? And Wolchanda's nodding, maybe she's going No, to not in that way. I'm nodding at what you said, but I, I just wondered if there's anyone who's maybe not spoken who might have things to say, because I know there's a lot of people with a lot to offer. <laughs> you don't have to, though. Otherwise, I'll just uh, reinforce what Shirley said about, you know, just this kind of general rule of thumb that, um, we can ask ourselves, is it good for me? And for, or is it good for others or for both? And that out of those three, when it's good for both, that's the very best. That's always the very best. So it's not really true actually to say that Theravada is not, is a kind of more selfish path than Mahayana or, I mean, it's often seen that way by, by people, but I think if you're really following like the early Buddhist teachings and especially around ethics, like actually the guideline is always that we should reflect and think about both. You know, if it's only good for ourselves and it's harming others, that's not a reason to perform it. But there is another sort of that says just thinking about others is actually the worst of all, which is really interesting. <laughs> so maybe that is where it differs a bit from Mahayana because they might not say that but we always look after ourselves first because we know that if we're not resourced if we're not in a good place we can't really benefit others that well yeah <laughs> Anne Marie <laughs> got her hand up thank you Aya yeah I was thinking about um something that actually came to mind when we're talking about the food but I think it goes for everything that helps me like practically um, with regards to figuring out whether something is wholesome or unwholesome um, first of all with the food when I eat something even if it's something like indulgent or something um, if I if I share it or if I feel like sharing it then I know it's a that feels different than when I grab it because it's uncomfort eating or something and then that, that's kind of my one of my ways of checking what am I doing here and I think the same goes for I, 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 I use it sometimes as well like um, like do I want would I want other people to see me doing this or sharing this in that sense with the world or something if that makes sense uh, thank you Yeah, thank you. That's great. We have a lot of opportunities to reflect in our lives. And it's great to hear that you're doing it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know when a good time is to stop. Is it a good time to stop yet? Or could we, should we keep going? Well, yeah, we have finished that one. So maybe we could just discuss a little bit more and then um probably wait till next week for the next uh, the next one's very short mind you so i mean we have another five minutes so we could read the next one if no one has questions now okay if that's good for you because you've got to have your lunch haven't you oh yeah it's fine i okay. it, we're good <laughs> thank you okay all right <laughs> okay all right okay so this one's called accomplishment and virtuous behavior what mendicants is accomplishment in virtuous behavior? Here, a noble disciple abstains from the destruction of life, abstains from taking what is not given, abstains from sexual misconduct, abstains from false speech, abstains from liquor, wine, and intoxicants. The basis for heedlessness. 
This is called accomplishment. This is called accomplishment and virtuous behavior. Yeah, <laughs> it's a nice five precept reminder for everyone. <laughs> yeah. 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 Wonderful. Yeah. So, any any questions, comments? <laughs> Complaints? Sharing? I know, I almost said it. <laughs> but then I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't feel it generous to invite that to you. Uh, okay. <laughs> Open for complaints. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of the precepts, um, I am in discussion with Ajahn Brahm about our Vesak day, and he's very kindly offered to do. Uh, we're going to have like a three hour session, and he's going to come for the first two hours, which is late for him, but he's going to offer the precepts. Uh, it's not until May the 27th, which is actually my birthday too, which is kind of nice. Uh, but we're having that and yeah, there'll be an opportunity to take the precepts. So it's really nice that we're talking about virtue and also the eight precepts for the day, you know, unless you want to, <laughs> unless you're an aspiring monastic and you want to commit to those eight precepts for longer, but normally it's just for the day. So it's quite funny because Ajahn Ram says that um, in one country, I forget where, it might be Sri Lanka, a group of people anyway, one time they said to him, oh, on those special days, we take 13 precepts. He's like, huh, you take 13 precepts? And they said, yeah, we take eight precepts in the morning, right? That's the eight precepts, including not eating after 12 noon, <laughs> not wearing jewelry, et cetera, and handling money. And then in the afternoon, we take the five precepts. <laughs> in other words, they drop the precept not to eat after lunch. <laughs> Because once you take the second lot, it kind of uh, overrules the first ones, you see. So if you want, I don't recommend it, but yeah, some people take <laughs> 13 precepts. <laughs> so it's not the, as you said earlier, uh, it's not the uh, quantity, it's the quality. It's the quality that counts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's fun. Mm. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so lovely. Yeah. We're getting some nice comments thanking Aww. you, Aya, for joining because I think it, it is really lovely, you know, when there's uh, two of us, there's a little bit of toing and throwing, yeah. and it, it's very lovely for me as well just to sit and hear, yeah, yeah, to hear what you have to say and have a different energy and some more sharing. It's been a very interactive session, which is nice. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. It's a nice group. I'm I'm it is. very appreciative that everybody's, you know, thoughtful and examining themselves and practicing too. It's not just sort of dhamma entertainment to distract you during COVID. So right. <laughs> great. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> thank you for having me. <laughs> I mean it's got the giggles. <laughs> someone someone's appreciating the the human. <laughs> it's really true I mean yeah it's really true because I wasn't I mean I kind of know this group by now right but we've been doing a lot of general Dhamma talks and kind of like going through the basics and making it I don't know hopefully engaging but I wasn't sure you know how popular the sort of group would be but it is turning out to be quite well attended and I, I really do think that's a testament to people's um interest in the Buddha's teachings directly from him, right? Directly from the words of the Buddha, which is a rare thing and a very powerful thing indeed. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I'm glad you like yeah. our little group because I feel rather, <laughs> rather delighted by it myself. And you're always welcome to join. I know you've got a lot on anyway. Maybe you could end by saying a few words about where you are and, and what you do. And I don't know, sure. just, just anything you like, really. Yeah, sure. Um, happy, happy to come. Thank you. And we are sort of new-ish, newly placed in the Redwood Forest in the Santa Cruz Mountains, which is just south of San Francisco. And it's a little cabin, um, sort of one bedroom, little cabin. And we just put up our first kuti a couple of weeks ago, week and a half ago. So we're planning on more. Um, our aim is to have about somewhere around five bhikkhunis staying here at any given time and room for maybe five or so lay guests 
to come and go. And we'll see how it works out. Uh, some of you might have heard we're having some um, plumbing improvements hopefully happening. We'll see what happens with that. But right now it's just <laughs> one little bathroom and we'll see how things go in the future. Um, yeah, and we do plan to have a uh, in-town sort of meditation center. There's a lot of interest from where we moved out of that people would still like a presence in town. So hopefully our lay community can can help us get that up and running and use the space while we're not there. Mm -hmm. And we can just come once or twice a week and give teachings and and the space can be used for, we have a, um, a Qigong teacher who's very good and she was doing it on Zoom for a while. So she plans to have it again when we're in town at the center and, you know, things other people can share have, have sits on weeknight while we're not there together, things like that. So right. yeah, we'll see, we'll see how it all unfolds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what I um, find inspiring also about your project, I mean, now it's really inspiring because you're actually in the forest, <laughs> but even when I met you, you know, there were just two of you in the city, like a little bit like how we're starting, but um, also Aya Santuska, who's your senior now, right? Your, um, abbess, I suppose. Um, she was just one in the beginning, and then you came along. So I want Aya Chitananda's coming along. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, basically you came along and that's when it was able to happen, right? Because she was alone for a while and then, and then yeah, yeah. yeah, once you get amazing. a second on, then. Yeah. yeah, right. We've got yeah. two more ladies interested who came for a first visit and it went really well. Um, yeah. Everyone seems to be getting along well, so we're hoping for more nuns soon. <laughs> right. Yeah, we'll Excellent. send some your way if if. Yes, They're send on that me over side spill. of the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> I'm planning to steal you for a while anyway. Oh, I, I dream of coming to visit and help you, you get will. going. You will. We'll see. Yeah. You'll yeah. be here one love day. Love to. Yeah. Lovely. Love to. Oh, I'd like to, um, just to quickly end, because I know you have mm -hmm. to go, but maybe um, Gunther could just say a few words about Dana. And if there's um, a link for your Karuna Buddhist Vihara also, we can give people the opportunity to contribute oh, there yeah. should i should i put that yeah that you, or? yeah yeah okay. you could do that okay. or even one of my co-hosts can do it because i know they're pretty, oh, that'd be pretty nifty they yeah i'm sure they yeah. can so going to just <laughs> say a couple of words <laughs> thank you um today i simply want to refer to the dana link in the chat box and ask you if you're able to to consider actively practicing generosity uh, which we have heard of and discussed about so much today by giving a Dana donation to help support the Anukampa Bikuni project and of course Venerable Chanda who so generously shares the Dhamma with all of us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and like we say, you know, you can also look up the Karuna Buddhist Vihara. And uh, I don't know if they've found the link, but now that you're not speaking, if you want to type it in, Aya, or oh no, it's there, it's there, it's there. There we go. Oh, nice. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so that will help towards the toilets and the cooties and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. All right. Well, we normally just end by um, unmuting everybody and giving people a chance to wave goodbye and hear their lovely voices. So I think let's do that. And then let's release Venerable uh, Santa Chit oh, sorry, Venerable Chitananda. <laughs> 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 I sometimes get you two mixed up. Santa Chita Chitananda. But yeah, Chitananda huh. means like delightful mind, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. Joyful, joyful mind. or blissful mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we will release you to your lunch. Aww. So let, let's <laughs> uh, let's unmute everybody. We can wave goodbye and see you soon, hopefully. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much.